So thank you guys for allowing me to come back. If you were with us last time, we were talking about the author, the one who inspired everything that's in here from cover to cover, face to face, every story, every person, every human being, everything that was made and was is our king, Jesus, right? But when we think about Jesus and you think about what was it Jesus taught? What was, what was his message? What was his primary message? What did he run around talking about? And most people, when you ask them, what was the most memorable thing Jesus taught? They might say something like, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Jesus taught that. That's a pretty important thing. You know, a crazier thing. Love your enemies. What? Feed them. You're crazy, Jesus. What do you mean feed my enemies, love my enemies? You might have those things, and, and you go to the Beatitudes. That's usually blessed are the poor in spirit, right? That's the stuff Jesus taught, and those are the things we run to. But if you really want to know what Jesus taught, in fact, I will tell you this. All of those stories, all of those other episodes and teachings that Jesus had do not make sense until you compare the first thing he talked about. So what did Jesus talk about more than anything else? The hint is in my sermon title. Almost 50 times in Matthew alone does Jesus talk about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. So if we were going to talk about what is the central message of Jesus, God of the universe, when he showed up here on the planet to have a chat with us, what did he talk most about? He talked about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Now let's parse those out for just a second. Because if you do not understand what the kingdom of God is, everything else goes off course. It sounds nutty. Love your enemies. That's nuts. But yet, if you put it in perspective of what the kingdom is, then things start to make sense. And we're going to, my course of time that I'm having up here, next time I come up, we're going to talk about the kingdom some more, because Jesus did. For those of us growing up, you might remember when family came over, you might have games and fun and play. When I was a kid, we, cousins, we have cousins, I mean, our family is like rabbits. There's my, my wife comes from a family of nine. I come from a family of five. My grandmother had nine children. So there was just people all around us all the time. And anytime my cousins came over, the kids would go play, go outside and play. And we'd make up games and we would do things. And I remember this one game that my brother brought to the table one time. And it was called Who, What, When, Where, Why. And it was a writing game or writing thing that he did in school that we translated to a game at the house and the way that it went was you were to make a story it was a creative writing class kind of a thing come up with a story in your head and then every single story he said has those questions you have to ask in order to make it an interesting story the who the what the where the when and the why so the first thing we would write down, who, and you'd write down who. Then you fold the paper like this and you pass it to the next person. Because their who went to somebody else and now they got to do the what, what happened. And then, the, and then they pass it on and then it's aware. And you get to the end of it and you read some really funny stuff. That just nonsensical, some of it, some of it's hilarious. And we would have a good time with that. It was a great way to learn how to write. When you look at the kingdom of God, you kind of have to do the same thing. If you don't understand what the kingdom of God is, you, we're going to approach this from the who, what, when, where, why way of seeing the world, just because that's what I came up with. So today, not where it's going to be on the what, but when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're going to look at what it is so that we understand its importance and put it in framework for everything else we will talk about after that. There's an interesting piece of scripture, if you'll go with me to Matthew chapter 11. In the gospel of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is out doing his thing. <clears throat> and John the Baptist's disciples, John the Baptist is in prison, and he sends his disciples, those who he was teaching and had been teaching for a long time over to Jesus to find out 
Here's John the Baptist. He's in prison, about ready to die, and he's been out there preaching in the desert. And he had all of these people coming to him, and he was baptizing them, and all of this madness was happening. And now he's in jail. He's looking at the end, and he's wondering, was it, was it worth it? Did I, did I do, are you the person, or is there somebody else? Did I do all of this for nothing, or are you who I think you are? He had his moment. And so his disciples come up to Jesus, and they ask him that question. Are you, John wants to know if he's wasting his time. And here's how Jesus answers them. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to start us off in verse 7. It says, as they went their way, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. So the disciples came, Jesus gives them an answer, and he sends them back. And then he turns his attention to the crowd. And he asked them this question, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Look at my suit. Soft. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is whom what was written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. What? The kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. What? How? What do you mean? Well, let's start with an understanding of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They are generally synonymous terms. In fact, if you read through and do a quick word study, you'll find that the kingdom of heaven is only used in the Gospel of Matthew. Everywhere else is called the kingdom of God. And in the Gospel of Matthew, only a couple of times Jesus changes it up to the kingdom of God. And I've seen guys do entire studies that are ridiculous about what that means. And it's real simple. Sometimes he's talking about the same exact thing using a different word. It's not that common. We overcomplicate it. You no, know, it means that for the Jews is a different message. That's why it was in the, in the Jewish... Uh, area over here by Matthew because he talks about Jesus to the Jews and everything else was Gentile. It's not a separation of that at all. If you ever get caught in a study like that, walk out. The kingdom of heaven is something different. So the question is, what is the kingdom? And to understand what a kingdom is, when did we even start talking about kingdoms? When is the first time in the Bible that it is ever mentioned about the idea of reigning over anything? Does anybody know? Genesis 127, go there with me. In the very first chapter of the very first book that God put together in this thing that called Genesis, and in the very first part of the story of creation, right in the very beginning of it, God introduces this concept. Starting in verse 26, and this is right in the middle of the creation story, says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. God did that. God made creation. God made the distinctions between men and women and man as one because he sees us as one in that species and then after he was making all of this creation he made plants he made animals he made water that kind of came came and went he was taking care of all this he creates this new species a species that even in the future Paul will say angels are like looking at like these guys are weird who are these why does God pay attention to them it was that intense so he makes these new creatures and he says I'm gonna give you dominion That's the first time that we see God saying that in his creation, he created somebody to partner with him in running the place. 
The kingdom of God, when you talk about the kingdom of God, sometimes we are talking about the physical creation of God's kingdom. Sometimes we're talking about a place called heaven. And the reason we get that confused is, and I asked somebody the other day, where is God's kingdom? And they said in heaven. He's there. We're here. God has a kingdom over there. And this is earth. This is the devil's kingdom. And God's going to come and fix all that one day. Wrong. God's creation in the beginning, and remember last time I was up here when we talked about it, it said Jesus created what? How much of, how much of creation did he have a foot in? It says everything was created by him, for him, through him. Nothing that was made was not made without him, right? So therefore, is this his? Does this belong to God, this place that we sit in? Does the physical universe we call earth, moon, stars, etc., is that his or does that belong to somebody else? It's his, right? So everything in creation belongs to him. So sometimes when we're talking about the kingdom of God, we are talking about nature. We're talking about creation. We're talking about the universe. We're talking about everything we see. That's all his. He made it. Of course it's his. But is that only the kingdom of God because later you read stuff where Jesus says something like I think it's in Luke 20 the kingdom of God is within you because somebody asked him where is the kingdom is the kingdom of God within us yeah. how is it the creation and how is it in us and how is it over there what is God's kingdom well I think you have to parse out the words and it, whether you're talking about the New Testament uh, word Baselia, which is kingdom, or the Old Testament word, which is Maluka, or something or other, both of them work the same way in this regard. Language in English is a little bit weaker than the original language in this way. Latin words, in which we eventually became to the Septuagint, when you get to the kingdom, talks about the end of that, the dome, the doma, the, the domus, the the control, the dominion, the domain. So the kingdom is the domain of God or being, it's the, it's almost like an active verb where the, the, the dome and kingdom is an action word that says you are under the kingship. So kingdom simply means I am in the domain of God. God's domain. Is everybody in God's domain? Yes. Yeah. Well, when we talk about physically, yes, everybody's here. When we start to talk about the kingdom of God, because what was the first thing Jesus went out and preached? Not a secret, it was the kingdom of God. Because it said that John the Baptist came and he preached what? Repent, for the kingdom of God is coming. Right? And here's Jesus talking to John's disciples. Guess what? The kingdom of God is here. What was on Jesus's death scroll on top of the cross. You guys remember? King of the Jews. He was killed for being a king. He was not killed for saying nice things. He didn't, they didn't kill him because he said, love your enemies. They didn't kill him because he said, don't worry, God will provide for you. Birds have what they have, flowers have what they have, God clothes them, God feeds them, don't worry about those things. He said those things but that's not what they killed him for. They killed him because of his claim as a king. It's a little bit weird when you think about it. So in the very beginning, we have this dominion where God creates a species, us, and says, I want, I'm going to share this with you. And we're going to share dominion. So I said that some of these other things you read about the kingdom don't make sense until you put them in order. Jesus told a parable about this man who had a vineyard. You remember that one? And he says he had this vineyard and he planted it and then he leased it out to some guys. And he leased it out to those people and they came in and vineyards are nice. I don't know if you've ever been in one. But these guys ran this thing. They were managing the vineyard, pulling wine from it, having grapes, doing whatever. And then one day the owner of the vineyard says, hey, I'm going to send a couple of guys down there to get some grapes. And they walk in, and these guys are getting anything from us. Get out of here. They give them a beating, and they send them on their way. He does it a couple of more times. And like, I don't know what's going on here. That's my vineyard. What are those guys doing? 
And so he sends his own son. That's what the story says. And Jesus is now bringing that, that picture of what they're supposed to see, right? Surely if I send my own son, they're not going to mistreat him. They know that's my property. They don't have any business acting like they own it. And what did they do to the son? They killed him. They said, ah, if we kill him, there's nobody to give the property to and we can have it. And Jesus said, what will the owner do when he comes in? He's going to take back his kingdom. He's going to reclaim it. So let's go back to Genesis. And in that very beginning, what happened? And we know the story. Man sinned, and it says through sin, the world, through one man, Adam, introduce sin into the world and then from that point on all of a sudden it everything was wrong it started going wrong and by the time you get to the 10th chapter of genesis you read a story a real quick excerpt of a guy named nimrod a mighty man of valor before the lord a mighty hunter it says he was the first mighty man it says before the lord and what did he do he built a kingdom He built a tower. We know it as the Tower of Babel. And from there, he was, man was now trying to make a name for himself. And in the physical kingdom of God, when the physical sin broke it down and it brought death, the first thing man did was create a kingdom to compete against the kingdom of God. Isn't that crazy? Man started setting himself up because he saw his own greatness. He saw... A mighty man of valor. And we love strong leaders, don't we? That guy's a tough guy. We're going to put him in charge. Let him, let him run the show. And they put Nimrod in charge because he was the best that man had. He was. He was a tough guy. And I know some tough guys. The kingdom of God since John the Baptist to right now in Jesus' time has suffered violence and violence takes it. First time I read that, I What? What? Lord, that's awesome because I'm a violent man. I know violence really well. I have hurt a lot of people. I've done some crazy violence. So I'm in. How do we, let's do a drive-by on the devils. I mean, what are we doing? What do you mean? You need tough guys? I know tough guys. Jesus, let's go get them. If it's the violent people you need, I know violent people. Guys out of prison, guys I've done time with, people that I know, cousins. You know, I got some crazy people. But that's not what he's talking about. Let's go to what the kingdom is, God's domain. He owns it all. His domain, and we can think of this in the terms of a digital world, right? If you've ever had a web page, you have a domain, www.yourfoolishness.com, right? That is your domain. You own it. Everything that happens in there only happens by your permission because it's yours. It's your domain. If something happens, it's because you got hacked. That means somebody without permission to be in your domain is in there messing around, right? When we broke the contract with God that we tried to have our own dominion and it was a dominion so that it would serve us. Nimrod built a tower so he can say, I have a name for myself and look at me. It always perplexed me when God rejected Cain's sacrifice. I didn't get it. Dude was out working in the field all day. Come on, God. Look at what he did. He got some good fruit there. What are you upset about? Why do you like the lamb? Because Abel understood the relationship with God. He knew that he could bring nothing before the Lord that was of himself as a sacrifice. It could only be what God gave him. And then he used it as a testimony of what would be future. Jesus was that lamb. The other brother showed his works. This is what I got. It was the beginning of evil in man. It's from that moment on, man has continually made his own kingdom and is in opposition of God. On the physical front, God's kingdom, this is all his, we're trespassers, all of us. Real legal aliens. You thought I was the only one. All of us. We don't belong here. We've messed it up. Everything here that we think is beautiful is trash compared to what God has created. We've ruined his environment. We've wrecked it. Read the end of Revelation. It says that God is going to come judge 
And he's talking about the judgment. Do you know that one of the judgments in the book of Revelation says that he is judging those who destroyed the earth? What? I thought I was supposed to do that. Got to make some money. That's what it says. So on the physical front, we messed it all up. We made our own kingdoms, and we have run out violently to make those kingdoms be what they are. Name one country on this planet that does not exist because of violence. Not one. They all started with violence. God's physical kingdom is under attack violently and violent men take hold of it. What about the spiritual? What about that piece where Jesus says, the kingdom of God is inside you? God's dominion is what he's talking about. There's not some magical little flake of universe inside me where God is there and it's, the, it's heaven. It's heaven right inside me, my body. No. The kingdom of God's, God's dominion, the dominion of a king is inside you because why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit wants to dominate your life. Romans 8.6 says that the, we read it in Bible study, you guys remember? The mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the spirit is life. That's what it says. So in my spiritual self, in my inner self, is that God's domain or do I own that? Paul would write, take every thought that you have under subjection of Jesus Christ. He even owns my thoughts. Those aren't even mine to be keeping. The domain of God's, God's kingdom is everything you can imagine. It is physical, it is spiritual, it's far away, it's close, it's everything. When Jesus said that the kingdom of God is coming, he was talking about God's reign, his kingdom, his dominion is on its way. It's not a physical heaven that he's dropping on top of earth. He's talking about his dominion, his reign, his domain, his right, his right to run this place. And everybody who thinks to run it is going to be ejected. That's what he said. He is going to kick everybody out. Everybody that is not of him is standing in God's judgment because they are ruining his creation. That's what it says. So when we think of the kingdom of God, and the reason I want to walk through that, because it's not just enough to know that the kingdom of God and what it is, but how we're supposed to behave in it. It suffers violence and violent men take hold of it. Didn't they kill John the Baptist? Didn't they kill Christ? Didn't they kill every single apostle and everybody that is a cloud of witnesses? They stopped killing us because we compromised the message. We joined this world. Shame on us. Shame on us for joining the world and trying to make it right. We are not fixing the world. We're supposed to declare God's kingdom. What did Jesus do? What did John the Baptist do? Repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand. What message would I give you that's different? What kingdom do you have? What have you built that is not God's? That you're going, oh, I have this life over here? Yeah, Sunday, Jesus, I invite you into it. It's all his, all of it. And if you do not repent of holding on to that world, you die in judgment with it. Do you remember Korah? Was it uh, Chronicles? Korah and the rebellion. 250 guys, this guy decides, I'm going to, you know what, Moses, God is, he's doing crazy stuff. So Korah goes out and he gets 250 guys to go tell Moses, you're out. We're leading now. You're, get out of the way. So Moses goes before the Lord. God says, I'm going to come and talk to these guys. God was going to kill everybody except Moses and Aaron. Literally everybody. You read the story. Moses is on his knees crying, God, please. Moses and Aaron both. Don't kill everybody. Just deal with those guys. So he does. And on that day, he says, okay, there's Korah and the 250. Everybody get away from them. Because I'm going to judge them. I'm going to show you. That's what he's saying in the world today. That this world is under God's judgment and hugging it. You're saying, judge me too. I'm sure Korah was a nice guy. I bet hanging out with him was fun. He was ambitious. He wanted to be the leader. He wanted to make stuff happen. 
But then God opened a hole and swallowed 250 powerful men because they thought they were going to stand in God's way. God is doing a thing. God is moving. God's kingdom is here in this place because you're here. We are part of God's kingdom. Yes, there's a physical part. Yes, there is a spiritual part. Don't get hung up on the stuff. Do you remember when Jesus was walking around in the temple and they were, oh, look at how beautiful everything we made. It's so great. Jesus pretty much called it trash. Knock it down in three days, I'll rebuild it. He was talking about himself, but he's saying, this, this is going to be nothing. They were so in awe. And it wasn't an impressive building, which was ripped down 70 years later by the Romans. And it meant nothing. Because the truth is, this is just trash. What we build and we think is so beautiful, according to what the scripture says, our righteousness is like filthy rags. So don't put in front of God how impressive you are for his kingdom. Humility is how we enter. We walk in and we say, God, I have nothing. I have nothing to bring to you except my shame. I have nothing to bring to you but this emptiness. I've tried to create a kingdom that was against your kingdom. And I'm, and I'm done. So my charge to you, as we walk through this time of understanding what the kingdom of God is and what does it mean to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, I'm going to start with this. You guys need to repent. I'm not serious. Check your hearts. What you stand and hold as your own, God will rip from you. But if you walk in the humility of the Spirit, you don't gratify the flesh. That's what Galatians 5.16 says. And then the kingdom of God, God's reign will be in you. It will be his kingdom will be there because it's you saying, reign in me, reign in my life. This is all yours. I got nothing. So my call to you today as we close up, search your hearts. Check in with the pieces that you are not turning over to the Lord and repent. Let go of this world. There's nothing in it that is worth holding on to. Nothing. It's trash. And we've ruined God's kingdom physically. We've ruined it spiritually. And every time we create division within the body, we're creating a kingdom within his kingdom, and he will step on it. The good news is, is Christ is an incredible king. He takes your life from what was actually darkness and blackness, and it says he transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Amen. You're in only one or the other. All of the other sub-kingdoms who have kings and whatever leaders involved with it are in the dark part. We're called away from that. None of that is ours. None of it. He calls us to the light and to put our focus on Christ and his kingdom and building his kingdom and building his people and having his people know him better so that they can raise up and tell of his good works. That's what's supposed to happen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the joy that we find in you. I thank you, Lord, for your word, which is powerful to cut through the hearts. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. And I ask you, Lord, that you would search their hearts. Show them, Father, those things they hold on to. Show them the kingdoms they've tried to build, even in, when they tried to do it through ministry. Tear down everything, Lord, that holds itself against you. And if nothing is left, then so be it, Lord, because it is better for us to go naked into heaven than to try to take any of this with us. Father, forgive our hearts. Move in your people. Remind them to call on their king and to find their place of repentance. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.